All righty. Welcome. I am Heather Pierce Campbell, the legal website warrior. I'm an attorney and legal coach based here in Seattle, Washington, serving online information entrepreneurs throughout the U.S. and the world. Welcome to another episode of Guts, Grit, and Great Business. I am super excited to bring our new guest today, Paul Ace. Welcome, Paul. Great to be on the show, Heather, and hopefully we can give as much value to your audience as possible. Oh, I'm confident that we will. I um, So you and I connected, gosh, probably a few months ago now. I yeah, want to say, yeah. was, let's get booked in for a podcast, like uh, three months, <laughs> three months uh, to get it in. <laughs> Right. It happens. Well, I think summer kind of happened in that time. Travel happened in that time. Right. A lot of life has been lived even in a few months. Um, it's great to see you again. For folks that are listening, stay tuned. Today's going to be a super fun conversation. When I first connected with Paul, I was like, oh, yeah, we got to have a conversation on the podcast. I think there's a lot that you're going to take away around um, building a business. So for those of you that don't know Paul and Paul, I'm trying to remember who first connected us. Can you recall? Uh, we, we were in a, uh, yeah, in a mastermind thing. Okay. So we're in the perfect. Nope. So good to know. And there's so many other awesome connections within that mastermind. So I love it when new people join and I get to meet the new folks. Um, for those of you listening that don't know Paul Ace, Paul is the founder of Amplify Ccom, a performance marketing agency. He helps seven-figure online course creators make an average of an extra $786,000 per month after working together for 12 months. Hopefully that made you sit up a little taller in your seat. <laughs> I think there's many of us who wonder what it would be like to make $786,000 per month. So meaning that product owners can enjoy spending more time with their family and stop burning time on crap a CEO shouldn't do. Unlike traditional agencies, they don't do retainers. They get paid on results, meaning your new customers pay for their services and it doesn't cost you a cent. I, I remember when we first connected, Paul, and you told me that and I was like, oh, like my equivalent in the legal world is contingency lawyering, right? Lawyers who only take on, a, they don't require any payment from their clients because either it's a high risk scenario or it's an area of law that other attorneys won't, won't do, right? Or they're working with clients who can't pay the fees mm. that, that they would normally require. And so it's on them to create a win for that client before they ever get paid a cent. And that's often, by the way, years into the process. Yeah. Right. So you um, play the long game. it is, it's the long game and it's, and it's, it's making a bet on themselves that they can create that win for their client. Right. And it sounds like you're a little bit in the same game. And the, the part about that, that I love is one, it gives people, especially in the legal field, uh, clients an opportunity to get support that otherwise wouldn't have support, right? And I think for your clients, gives them access to strategies and support that they wouldn't otherwise get. And then the upside is really significant. So I, you know, anyways, I'm so fascinated by your business model. I know you've had a really interesting journey into yeah. You know, everything that you've learned around marketing and sales and copywriting, like even reading through the list of questions that we have down today, you know, as just some kind of mile markers, like stay tuned, folks, there's a lot here. So, Paul, I'd love for you because I, you know, there's a couple things that I really care that our listeners get out of these conversations. And one is an understanding of you as a person. Right. I think we all want to know the person behind a business, behind a certain set of expertise, behind online marketing. And I want people to walk away with things they can start doing today in their business to show up differently and create some wins. Right. So those are my goals for you. I would love, you know, because there's no part of really your personal story in an intro. And so we just need to dig into that. I'd love to know more about your background, kind of, you know, tell us the kind of the quick signpost as the way into your work that you're doing now. Yeah, cool. So here's, here's, here's a whistle stop tour, right? Of, right. Of how, how we ended up where we are right now and 
num- uh, number one is that I came straight out of school and was like, am I going to go into university? I was like, nah, don't want to, <laughs> don't want to go. I got the grades. I was like, nah, I don't want to go. I want to go earn some money. So I went and worked at Subway for four, four pounds 70 an hour, uh, which I had to work two hours to cover the cost of parking. <laughs> oh, <laughs> which I, and then I was on like three hour shifts. So I was like, I was bringing them like 200 pound a week, which is like terrible, right? Uh, I stayed there for three months. I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, so I went to work for a, a bakery instead, uh, a, a massive bakery chain, and then went to be store manager by 20 years old, running 20 staff, which was kind of uh, a little bit crazy, a bit overwhelming. I wasn't wasn't the leader that I am today, put it that way. I was a bit more dictatorship than, uh, mm. than laissez-faire, I think, back then, but you, le- you learn along the way. And uh, so I stayed there for five years and then obviously made the natural transition. So where do you go after bakery? I then became a wedding singer. So (laughs) (laughs) just uh, natural, natural. I mean, that seems like the natural progression for so many of us, right? Like what's next? Wedding singer. (laughs) So, so I'd been playing drums since I was 11 years old, played drums, a little bit of bass, guitar and, um, I couldn't learn to sing. I didn't learn to sing till I was like 21. And wow. and like, I, I couldn't sing a note. I remember when, even when I was like 15, uh, the rest of the band used to laugh when I tried to do backing vocals because it was so bad. And so I got to 21, like I had some singing lessons and stuff like that. And yes, you can learn to sing. Got to I love 25. that. Folks, listen to that. You, you can, can learn to the sing. That's amazing. I'm proof because I was terrible. Um, I'm still, I'm, I was still wasn't, I was, I always said I was like the Robbie Williams kind of singer, right? So I wasn't the best singer, but I could entertain. Yeah. So that, like, and and that went was worth its weight in gold. So then at 23, I quit my job. Uh, I I cut my pay in half overnight, and went out as a full time uh, singer. So I was doing the pubs, the clubs, all those kind of things. And, and you have for for folks that are not watching, you have something behind you on the wall that to me shouts music. Maybe it's not. What is yeah. that? So, uh, so oh, it's in reverse. Uh-huh. So the, the, this side, that's an award from a client. Uh, they give they give out million dollar awards when their customers make a million, and they were like, "You helped us make a million, so we're going to give you an award for free." So that was nice. Got it. But it looks kind of like a big disc, right? I'm it looking does, at it. it I'm does, thinking yeah. like, "Oh my gosh, is this from your music days?" Hilarious. So they had it. They they put an umbrella on their gold gold disc because uh, uh, they're all about making it rain. Ah, so, I got uh, it. And then the other side, it, that poster. So if if you can't, if you just listen to the audio, it's like an A two poster, like massive poster. That was the one of the the first ever gig that I did solo. They put this massive A board outside, um, and I remember because I should have been playing as a band, uh, and I, I should have been playing drums that day. And the singer was like, "I can't be bothered. I'm going to tell him my meal." Uh, <laughs> So he just cut out and I've been practicing stuff for about six months. And so I rang him up. I was like, I hear you short of a band this afternoon. I was like, I can come and sing if you want. They were like, sure. Okay. I didn't know after songs, after stuff like was off. But off the back of that gig, I ended up getting a 12 month residency off it on the first, on the first time. So they had me back every month for 12 months. It was the dirtiest, grottiest place in uh, in, in Leicester where I was living at the time. Stickiest floors and everything. People loved it. You know, so um, oh, those are the places memories are made. Huh? Oh, it's like you've you've, you've got to, You've got to do it. Like going in a proper working men's kind of pub, and one of the song choices I had, I think, was "Ladies' Choice" from Hairspray, and I was like, "What am I doing?" <laughs> right. So you learn so along the way. You learn do your audience. learn along the way. I'm curious what that poster in the frame behind your shoulder means to you now. Like part of it, I'm thinking in my own head, like the courage that it took to do that. Oh, or yeah. or was it the fact or maybe both that it led to like this series of personal wins for you? I was I was bricking it at the time. I mean, the, the interesting thing. So my wife actually put this uh, frame together. So if you see down the like the right hand side, the, there's loads of different business cards on there. And they're all the iterations of the brand that was created over time. So it started off like Vista print, just like the cheapest cards you could get. Right. And then it it like worked over time and then you can uh like if you're seeing on the video as well you can actually see like all the different promotional things that we created mm-hmm. like i created two albums on there like different things around that uh, so she put all that and like overlaid it all over this original poster which was really cool um so, so to me that was like 
the progression of be, be becoming a wedding singer. And I went from, I remember being at this showcase, which was kind of like, they get all the work in men's clubs, like all, all those kind of people, right? I come, come around and they go, I'll tell you if you're any good or not, and I'll, I'll lie if they're not. <laughs> so it was that kind of place. I, and this bloke said to me, he said, how much are you? I said, 150 pound for the, for the night. And, it, and he went, never pay them more. People will never pay you more than 130. And I always remembered that guy. Mm. And then like two years later, I charged 2000 pound for one day for the wedding. Right. And it, it was in the nicest way possible. It was a bit of a screw you. <laughs> uh, and, and because I learned how to market, I, mm. I, I learned how to create an offer different to what everyone else was in the space. So everyone else was going, I'll sing at your wedding. That was it. So what I did, I looked, I'm going to take it a stage further and went, okay, well, what are all the things that I do give them? So we'll give you the mics for the speeches. We'll provide you all the lighting. We'll give you all the, uh, we'll give you the PA system for free. So you won't have to pay for hiring any of that. We, I'll sing your first dance song. I'll give you a free album, right? I'll help you with the wedding planning. I'll give you access to our free group of brides with like 3000 other brides in there. Right. And so I, I stacked all the value and it was like, I'm not just singing at your wedding. I was singing at the bre wedding breakfast. I was singing at the reception. I was singing at the ceremony and I laid it on top. I was like, so you can have this package, this package or this package. And what I found is I could work less than most other wedding singers because they were charging like two, 300 pounds mm -hmm. and I could charge a thousand pounds, 2000 pounds because I stacked the value and I learned how to market myself better. And I, presenting myself with a level of professionalism, right? Where everyone else is kind of like, yeah, cool. Yeah, we'll be there on the time I was like, right, here's the agreement, right? Here's, mm -hmm. here's the itinerary. This is what we're going to be going through. I had an automated CRM system and everything. Like, I built all that stuff different to the rest of the market. So mm -hmm. they just got that level of professionalism. Where was it on your journey that you think you started paying attention to that kind of stuff? It was a, it was a really about six months into starting the wedding singing. I, sorry, starting to the sing, the singing full time because I, I need to pay the bills, right? So, mm, um, so is that a necessity? Thing, well, the thing, the thing is, when you when you start out, really being a singer, you weren't doing much in the week, right? Because it was like it's like all... every weekend you're out, but in the week you're like, well, what am I going to do with myself? So I was like, well, I'll learn how to market the business better. So I started creating all this stuff. And before I knew it, I had a full-time job marketing the business. <laughs> uh, and then I read all these books. And I remember I was sitting at the sitting in the pub the other day with uh, uh, another guy who owns a business and stuff. And he was like, how did you get into reading books and stuff? And we were talking through. And I realized on my Audible, I've got 107 titles on there that I've gone through over the last three or four years. Because every time I used to get, I used to play badminton a lot. And it was a 25 minute drive. So I'd put it on double speed and I'd listen to the audible on the way there and the audible on the way back. So I get through two hours of audio every time and I do that twice a week. So I'm getting through half a book a week, every week. So in a month, you know, you're getting through at least two books, add that over the course of the year, that's 24 books. You do that for a couple of years before you know it, like you've soaked up like 40, 50 books on marketing sales and everything else in between. Cause I've never been a big reader but I'll listen and I'll listen and I'll listen and I'll take that stuff in. So that was really interesting, you know, how it all came together. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's so fun to hear what sparks somebody's, you know, paying attention to a new, new thing, trying a new thing, kind of getting bit by the business bug. Right. Mm -hmm. And especially when you take something non-traditional, like when it comes to business, like wedding singing or something that for most of us sounds outrageously difficult yeah yeah right? and I, was, I wasn't the best singer either like that like I, I would never claim to i had a big voice and it, it, it always it was always funny like if you go on holiday and there'd be a karaoke and then like i'd bash out like my way or ness and Dorma or something and people were like what the <laughs> hell what well, that's what's that skinny guy doing over there <laughs> I love it. And I, <laughs> I personally love the courage that it takes to step into something like that. I think mm -hmm. there's big lessons in, you know, for so many of us, and I don't know if that felt outside of your comfort zone at the time. I think for so many of us, that's like public speaking or some other thing that feels really uncomfortable. Right. 
Um, do, do you know what my my wife said to me? I need to write the book called Marketing <laughs> on the Dance Floor. Um, but she said that's what this should be the title of it because there were so many lessons that came from that yeah. that that came across the other stuff. And what one of the one of the big things was, I didn't get nervous when I was on on stage. And here's the reason why: because it wasn't me. Mm. It was the, it, it it was the ten x version of me. It was the amplified ver- version of everything that was, and that's where like the amplify CCOM as well. Like CCOM stands for conversational commerce, and we use the words amplify because it like had heritage of the whole like you know turn the dial up to eleven kind of thing. Um, but what was really interesting is when I started getting into marketing and stuff, it was like. I started in more Facebook lives and things like that. Mm. And I always put on this persona and it wasn't, it wasn't not me, but it was an amplified version of me, like that extra kind of energy and extra thing. Like if you meet me, like just generally for a chat, like we're going to have a chill chat and stuff like that. But like, if I'm on a podcast or something, I'm going to get more excited about everything and be more, Mm. you know, the hands go everywhere and (laughs) all that kind of stuff, you know, was that, do you think that was an intentional strategy or was that what happened and became the pattern as a result of that boost of adrenaline that happens when you're in front of an audience, right? Yeah, it was a combination, it was a combination of the two, so partially intent, like over, over time it became more and more intentional, like mm-hmm. to start off with it was just nerves and adrenaline, but over time it became this almost like I, I had these red shoes as well. Well, little red and white winkle picker shoes, like old 1950s style. Once I put those shoes on, it was like Dorothy right from the Wizard of Oz. Like it was uh, like then I'd stepped into that persona. Mm-hmm. And as soon as I went on stage, I was in that persona. As soon as I came, it was like a different person. Just like this weird thing being on stage. It's kind of like uh I and I've never taken drugs, by the way, but I imagine <laughs> it's like cocaine, right? Especially I'm not gonna say that with a with a legal website, worry. Right. Um, but <laughs> I imagine it's like cocaine, right? Because you get this massive high mm. and then it all builds up throughout the night to that last song where everyone is like ready for it. And then you get to the straight bit afterwards where everyone's like, that was amazing, that was amazing. And then it's suddenly like you were nobody again. Mm. And I think over time I felt that was really hard to hit, deal with those highs and lows because then you're driving home at 2 a.m., you all that adrenaline that just dropped out of you, you're about falling asleep at the wheel and it it doesn't it's not as sexy in reality as it as it looks on the outside mm. uh, so there was really positives and negatives but what i learned is i learned about like things like embedded commands i, I learned about how to create a movement and move move people to action so like when you see someone in an audience that are just don't want to do anything right they're just kind of like okay that was very nice yes thank <laughs> thank you <laughs> Right. It's it's not quite the same as like towards the end of the night. I was like, right, is you don't just go, is everyone having a good time? It was all about tonality. And I learned when you learn about tonality, you learn about how that copies across the copyright and how it goes to the content that you put out and everything else that like only seven percent of communication is the words that you use. Mm. Which to me is is madness. But like I could go, only seven percent of communication is the words that you use. But instead, by going, only 7% of communication is the words that you use. Like, it has a completely different feel Mm -hmm. to it. And I learned that, like, from the singing is like, is everyone having a good time? And people are like, yeah. Like, I said, is everyone having a good time? And they're like, is everyone having a good time? And and then it's like, you've got everyone on board, right? But you have to bring people up in layers. I say it's in tonality. It's like the roller coaster effect. Mm -hmm. Use it in marketing, use it in sales. And you kind of ratchet people up, ratchet people up, ratchet people up, and they go, and then bring mm. it down, and then you go again. So, yeah, short short story of uh, wedding singing <laughs> went from there to selling bridesmaids dresses because that was again another natural next step. Right, uh, right. And and then I realised from the bridesmaids dresses, the thing that I really liked out of all of it was the marketing, and that was the stuff that I was good at. Mm. So. Mm. Got got some good introductions with people and stuff, and then we went from we went went from there. Really, um, I started building people a bot on Facebook Live for free, uh, yeah. for about three four months, and uh, yeah, with I had John Lee Dumas on there from Entrepreneurs on Fire, and um, he was like, "This is really good." We doubled his webinar show rate, like, um, and we just did it for free. And then I told him the results, and he was like, "This is really good. Who can I introduce you to?" 
and that opened the door. That, right. And then we got results and we got results and we got results. And then we became the marketing partner now with the businesses that we do have. Mm. Well, that, you know, that talking about that bot, it's like, I think in business, the question always becomes, I mean, technology can support, right, our growth and things along the way, but it really is about communication. How are we communicating with our audience, our intended audience, even your stories about the wedding singing, like everything you describe is about how we communicate, whether it's connection. visually, yeah. yes, that how we communicate and create that connection. I mean, I've never been a wedding singer except once in my life. My sister, damn her, asked me to <laughs> sing. Actually, she, yeah, she asked me to sing at her wedding. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, first of all, I'm not a singer. I mean, once I, I first issue, <laughs> that is a, that's the first issue, which feels a little bit like a problem if you've been asked to sing at somebody's wedding. And while I like singing, I've never considered myself a singer. Right. And, and anyway, so I was like, okay, only because it's my sister, will I do this? I ended up writing her a song. I grew up studying piano and playing piano. So I wrote her a song, had written the lyrics and that became the song that I sang because it was actually a song for her and her hubby. And the it gets a little bit more complex when she then announced, like, not only are you singing at the wedding, the wedding's on a boat and, you know, you'll be at the front. And so, like, I had to rent, you know, the the portable piano, digital piano. It needed to have a weighted keyboard because that's the only way that I can really play. Yeah. So it was like quite an ordeal to bring all this equipment and a PA and a sound system and set all of this up. And then I'm on a boat and it's, it's rocking and I get very motion sick, oh. right? Like boats and me do not get along. Um, and then it's in the setting sun. So I'm trying to read my music. And I mean, I should have had it memorized, which I'm sure I partly did, but really, you know, it's like the safety of having that music there. If you're not a singer and you don't want things to go wrong at your sister's wedding. And I just remember it took everything I had to get through that one performance, singing and playing the piano and not losing it on this rocking boat while looking into the setting sun. <laughs> One and done. I have never sang at a wedding again. I, I I'm sure I'm certain that I will not. <laughs> but do, do you know what's really interesting as well? That like you you said, I, I don't consider myself a singer. Uh -huh. And I think like, you know, if you talk about the lessons of business, it's identity is so important with the whole thing, yes. right? It, it's it's like, oh, I'm not a salesperson, or I'm not a marketer, or. I haven't got a seven figure business or whatever the thing is. It's, and it, it's not the, like, I hate the fake it till you make it. That doesn't mean, yeah. you know, sit, sit on a, a, a pile of sand from a sandpit outside and then take a selfie just at the right angle. So it looks like you're on a beach with a laptop. Um, it, it means like act as if you were already that person. Right. And what the biggest thing that, that I've learned certainly over the last couple of years is it's about certainty and belief we, yes. we, within of like that confidence and transfer of certainty from one person to another, whether it be for sales, whether it be for just general communication with a, with a client of like getting your point across, but not, not in a kind of like, you should do this. It's like, here's the upsides. Here's the downsides. Like what, what do you, what do you want to do? Like it's, mm -hmm. it's always your decision. But here's the upsides and, and downsides considered just from my unique perspective of going through this a few times. And when you can come from that place of certainty where like I've been there, I've done it. Mm -hmm. And the best way to get certainty is just go and do the thing. And most people, you know, I, I don't know if you see it a lot. I see a lot of people right now, they're trying to teach something that they haven't done. And to me, that's one of the most frustrating things. It's like, don't give bad advice to someone who gives bad advice to someone who gives bad advice to someone. Like just go and do the thing, get the runs on the board and then share your own experiences, what you did. Mm -hmm. That makes a big, big difference. Mm. I mean, you raise a couple of really important points right there. This conversation around identity mm. is huge. It's like the only conversation we should be having when it comes to growing our business, right? Mm. 
Yeah, because... and it's like who who do you want to who do you want to become? And yeah, and who do you I... need to become from an identity yeah. standpoint in order to create the business that you really truly desire to create? The fascinating thing is as well, like last I think it was last year, uh, we decided okay we're going to do a ten year plan, a three year plan, a twelve month plan, and then work backwards from that. Right, so. Mm -hmm. Because we're like, well, that's what a big business would do. So we act, acted as if, and, and don't get me we, we've got a growing team anyway. We've got like about 10 people on the team or something at the moment. And um, we, it's very, we, we aim to be as lean as possible. Like I used to see it as a badge of honor, the more people you had on your team. And now I see it as a badge of honor, how, how lean your team can be and still run effectively. Yeah. Uh, but as we were going through those plans and you start working backwards over the next 12 months, like for example we we had a, a charity donation contribution in terms of how many kids we wanted to help in 10 years time mm. we've done it already and we were like what you, you know and it, this is it, it isn't a, a ploy of like look how many people will help but it's about you set the intention of the thing yes in 10 years time yes and it's amazing because you've set the intention and because you've got the certainty and clarity of the behavior that you create and then causing that to occur then it naturally then comes sooner and easier because you've called it out into the world like the last vision board i created uh it took three years to complete everything on the board yeah and we went from a two up two down to a five bedroom house because i put it on the list yes. here's my shopping list of what i want to achieve right and it doesn't happen without action mm -mm. but like vision plus action equals the outcome and the lifestyle that you want that's right. Well, and the, the vision and the action, I think, are critical. And so often the missing piece, though, is that identity conversation, right? Yeah, People yeah, can yeah. want what they want all day long. It can be in their vision. If they're not having the identity conversation of who am I first yeah. before what's going to show up, it won't show up, right? And the interesting so thing is, right, we go through phases. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I say phases, it's more evolutions where like you and i wrote i wrote a real long facebook post on this a while a while back where it's like when you're a kid you, you're in discovery phase right so mm -hmm. the whole whole time when you're a kid until you get to about 19 20 and then and then you start you realize the real world is scarier and then you go into survival phase and survival phase is just you do you're just building and building and building and building and building and you're like okay i got a little bit more savings this year right i got a little bit of a better car or a bit of house or you know, I like I I found I found a partner who who's going to support me through everything in the journey, all that stuff. And some people stick at that phase forever, just because, and that's typically because of the actions that they take. Uh, I and that some people might listen to that and go, "That's so wrong. You don't know my circumstances." But it's typically if you took different actions, you get a different outcome. Mm -hmm. And then you get to the third phase, which is something I went gone through in the last like you know one one to two years, is you go from running away from stuff to running towards things, right? So you go from, oh, I want this, I want that, I want that, I want that, I want that, and, and running away from all the pain. And then you're kind of going towards a different level of pleasure, right? Different things that you want in your life. And it's not about physical, tangible things, but it's about what do I want to achieve? And, and, how, and that transition, I think, was even harder than from like childhood to adulthood of going but i've always run away from pain it's just like oh backs to the wall right the wall like i always say i'm like that war general cap like if you're like oh you gotta make money this month i'll make money this month but like if the pressure's off you're like okay cool like we'll keep we'll keep moving things forward but not to the same level and it wasn't until like i became that new identity within myself and that took like three months to shift of a lot of work of like, what do I want? And I couldn't even figure out what I wanted. So I had to say, well, what do I, do? What do I not want? <laughs> and then from there, like it, it, it kind of, it rolls through. So if, if you listen to this and you're going through that in your life right now, you might be in the survival stage in your twenties or you might even be in your thirties or your forties. Mm -hmm. But then when you get to the next stage, just know you are going to hit that identity crisis where you, you suddenly feel like, that's when we self-sabotage right and revert back because that's all we know um so always have the right support network around you i think for those things as well like i had a mentor that's helped guide me through that a lot mm -hmm. um and it, it, 
he called it uh, your ikigai, which is your, mm-hmm. like your central. Yep. What is a Japanese what is a in the middle? So, yep. Yeah. It's, it's worth worth uh, reading up on. Totally. Well, and you might ha- you might have multiple periods in your life where you go through that identity conversation, right? Hundred percent. Every yeah. every growth phase, including those that are precipitated by pain, if you're if you're really there to learn the lessons, you are having that identity conversation in in different cycles and in different ways, but repeatedly through life. Um, and it's just a really important one to return to because who I am now in my mid forties is, you know, there are some core tenets of me that are the same, but is pretty different than who I was, you know, at parts in my thirties, at parts in my twenties, right? And that's that's the I think the way it should be. Yeah, um, that's the game. That's yes. that, that's what makes makes it fun. I always say like, life is like a video game, and like you 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 play at one level and you're like oh i'm getting good at this this is easy this is easy and then a new level comes up and you go wait a minute i but i haven't got the bow and arrow i need for that like how do i go oh i wish i, I wish i'd got more coins from the last level so i could have spent them on this level right <laughs> right yeah oh my gosh so funny and so true um so you know i love this i think like we were talking before we went live like this personal growth conversation even this identity conversation it's it's in, indistinguishable from the business building journey you know there are phrases around like you want to really do self growth become an entrepreneur you know like from the standpoint of facing your demons and figuring out what's keeping you stuck and stopped and, you know, not achieving the things that you want to in your business life. I'd be curious now, based on where you're at, right? You've got this system, you have this way of helping your clients achieve things that probably to them felt unachievable before working with you. Do you want to share with us a little bit more about how you got there, what your work looks like, who you're working with, right? What is, obviously you don't have to give us all the secret sauce, but give us some glimpses kind of into your world and the work that you're doing right now. Yeah. So we, we work with high ticket coaches. So who, who are already doing seven figures a year. And typically they come to us when they're not necessarily fully stuck, but they're not growing as fast as they want to be. Right. So like, I spoke to someone the other day and it was like, well, we've grown 10% since last year. And I was like, is that where you want to be? I, I, I was like, why, why think so small? And, and then they were like, well, I just, I just didn't know how it was possible. Right. So mm. we, and what we, what we find a lot of the time is when you're at that, you, you've got, you've got levels of it. Right. So when you're at like zero to six figures, it's just, just hustle it out. Just, you know, go do more volume, reach out to more people, do what you need to do, and then you'll go make six figures. Seven figures, again, you just do more of what you just did, and you'll you'll eventually get there, but it's or tough. Or build out some team to help you do more of what and you build, just build out, did. Build out some team a little right? bit, yeah. But you don't have a lot for team because like as much as like a million dollars in, in sales isn't that much in net. If mm-hmm. unless your margins are, are, are tight and you're running a tight shit, so mm-hmm. you don't have the cash to bring on the best talent, so you're still managing the talent. So all you've done is you, you, it's quite often you just you moved, moved your price, you, you, yeah, your you obligations moved it along a little bit, yeah. Yes. So well, then what happens when you get to mid seven figures? When like typically people are doing like two hundred and fifty thousand, and that's why they 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 come to us a lot when they're doing like like two hundred three hundred thousand a month, and they've got some team, mm-hmm. they've they've got some systems and some structure there and they're like, oh, row, row, our return on investment, you know, on ads is, is, is pretty good. But every time we try and scale, it just breaks. And it's like, okay, well, well, why? Mm-hmm. So what we look at is imagine like a plumber coming in, right? So plum, plumber comes in and then you go, oh, the kitchen, kitchen sink keeps leaking. And what you do, like you go through all, all the U-bends, right? And everything is, let's see where the leak is. And then, and then what, what we do, we identify firstly, map out the whole customer journey from end to end. Like, and, and most businesses that we go into at that level, and even ones at an eight-figure level that we've seen, there's no customer journey mapped out. There's no kind of like, what what is every single email, every SMS, every funnel mm. step, every single piece and touch point that someone sees along the way. So firstly, we understand what is a current customer journey. And then once we've understood that, then we go, okay, where's the biggest bottleneck? 
And then we go and fix that first. What do you right. think is stopping most of your clients, even at that level of $200,000, $250,000 a month from really having done the work to dig into that customer journey? What's What stops most of those businesses? Some of it is, uh, so time, mm. e expertise. A lot of people who have got to 250K a, a month have come in as business owners and had to bolt on them being a marketer because they were the only way people who could make it rain up to that level, right? But yeah. it doesn't mean they live, breathe, love marketing. It it means they, they maybe they love the product. They love fulfilling on the product and they love getting their message out to the world. They've figured out how to do it. Yeah, they yeah. figured out how to do it at a certain level. They're not data driven. The 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 majority of people like I, like if I say to someone, okay, so what's your what's your lifetime customer value? And they go, um, I don't know. And I, and I go, okay, so how do you know how much to acquire a customer? So because if you if you don't know how much a customer is worth, how do you know how much you can spend to acquire one? And they're like, oh, that's probably why I haven't scaled right. And the reason. A lot of people don't scale as well. And this is like, take take this as a nugget. And it, depending on what level you're at, you'll be able to implement this in, in, in different levels. But the reason most people don't scale beyond that point is because they don't know the numbers well enough where they're looking at the numbers on day zero, not on day 30 or day 60. So what I mean by that is they go, if I put a dollar in today, how much do I get out? And if they put a dollar in and they get, one dollar and 20 cents back they go, i can't afford that i've still got a team to pay but if they if you look at your numbers on a lifetime customer value perspective and go okay i put a dollar in today and yeah it's worth one dollar 20 today but in 30 days it's worth two dollars and in 60 days it's worth four dollars and then in 12 months it's worth 20 dollars now if you knew that and you had the cash flow to support it how fast would you scale right? You go a lot, lot faster. So what we look at is how do we firstly increase the lifetime customer value? And that's not about like, just sell them anything. It's like, no, what, what are they already asking for that we're not yet providing? What's the levels of this, right? So we quite often will go in, we'll reposition the offer and all the, all the pieces around that. We'll look at uh, like even on the targeting stuff and everything on the ads, like, okay, great. So when you sell the one-time upsell, like, do you bring people back to it in the ads? Do you bring people back to it in your emails? No? Okay, great. Well, that's just found money then, right? So mm -hmm. we look look at all the hidden places that are losing money. And then we look at how to maximize the lifetime value of every single customer. So they've got more lifelong customers and that each one of them are worth more. Because mm. like as Dan Kennedy says, whoever spends the most acquired customer wins. Mm. Well, and it's such a good example, like you just walking through that process the way that so many of us are leaking money from the edges yeah. of our business, right? And I say it's beyond leaking, it's bleeding. Literally, yeah. like if, if 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 it was a human body, they'd literally be putting you on a stretcher right now and like stick, sticking you straight, straight in. It's like, oh my God, we've got to perform surgery on this. But because totally. you can't see it, <clears throat> right? It, That's right. It, We're it, not making different decisions. You don't realize how bad the problem is. Yeah. I was having a conversation with um, somebody on the podcast earlier this week that was talking about how most businesses are focusing on that very initial conversion, right? We're, we're sold this idea that like, if you don't convert somebody within the first 30 or 60 days, you know, go keep looking for additional customers, which is what a lot of small businesses do rather than continuing to nurture the ones you already have along. I mean, there's 85% of your potential client base in the nurturing, not in that initial yeah. conversion, right? 100%. And I, so we, we do we do a lot of that as well with the whole, you know, email wise. I, I've got about, we, we typically will go, let's create a live version of a campaign. Mm -hmm. So we'll do a launch, but then we'll turn it into an evergreen campaign afterwards. So then I've got like, seven different campaigns chained together in yeah uh so i always know they're going to the next and the next and the next and the next like continuing that conversation and i think so many small businesses drop off they don't examine that client journey of what happens next for the folks that don't take a step but so many clients and potential clients it takes some time it takes some nurturing for them to go from being 
you know, problem aware to solution aware. And so many people, even when they think they have a problem, they don't accurately identify what the problem is. And I'm sure you see that all the time from yeah. the perspective of your clients, right? I, the, 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 the phrase I use is the <laughs> chain of causality. So it, it's like, for example, if, if you looked at a tree and then you saw the branches are starting to go funny, right? Some people will look at that and they say, the apples are going funny. Why? Because the branches are falling off. It's not because the branches are falling off. You, and you realize there's an, oil, there's an oil rig going through the river just behind the tree, right? That's like killing the root. So you, you, you have to follow the chain of causality backwards. Imagine it like a garden path. So you start at the end of the path. You have to reverse engineer all the steps that were taken um, in a more gruesome way. It's like a murder, right? They, they, they go, okay, well, hey, where did it end up? And then let's get let's go back follow follow all the clues that went backwards and and then you, you come to the end end solution. But most people stop halfway and think they found the problem. Mm. Well, it, that tree example is a great one. We actually had a tree in our backyard, and I am a nature lover, and I'm married to an extreme tree lover. I mean, we named our kids after trees, both of them. So um, we had this tree and it was beautiful and it had grown. It was a new tree. We planted it. It had grown for a few years. So it was probably like, you know, 14 feet tall or something. Still a baby, but it had done some growth and it started failing. And it, you know, and so my, of course my husband was doing all this research and we thought, okay, maybe it's kind of been a drought year. It's not enough water. Maybe this particular tree is prone to, you know, a type of bug blight or a mold or something we don't know about. Right. He did all this looking, 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 couldn't find the answer. And it continued to decline. And like one day it literally just dropped all of its needles, just boom. And it was actually a different tree. We had a really large tree that we had to clean up and we had an arborist come. He looked at that back tree and he said, do you know what the problem was? This tree was rooted a little too deep in the ground. He said, trees have breathing mechanisms at the base of the tree above the roots and they need a little air. And if there's not enough air, the roots literally can't breathe. We did and you not found that out. We found that out expert. because we talked to an expert. And here's my husband who loves trees, like literally reads everything he can about trees when he has a spare moment. You know, he could identify like any tree that you look at. It was the expert that told us what the problem, yep. you know, and it's just like such a classic example of how we need to stop doing all the looking ourselves and bring in experts that can help us see something in a totally different way. 100% like back to the video game analogy right it's kind of like you, you just go through and I, like, I see it as a game every day where I'm just like okay that num that number is not quite where we want it to be great what can we do to fix it oh look we did that and it changed it mm -hmm. like to, to me I just love watching percentages go up and it's just like it, it's, it, it's just the magic of it all so fun and it takes for those of us who don't necessarily know how to or don't love to look at that type of data in our business it takes bringing somebody on board that can help us do that right to be yeah. looking at the right things so um i want to be respectful of your time i know we are bumping up against the top of the hour paul for those who are listening and are like hmm i my curiosity is peaked about you know even just hearing you walk through that scenario with clients like what else somebody could learn through you through your services where do you like to connect with people? Yeah, so best place to go is to amplifycom.com. So that's amplify, the letter C, uh, com.com. Com. Mm. And uh, on there, you'll see a, a little menu bar at the top mm. that says resources. And in the resources, we've also got like a uh, Beyond Seven Figures audit. We've got seven figures to double your high ticket sales. So there's a lot of free things in there that can just, uh, really help you grow and scale and I, I'm a fan of not holding anything back so like go, go mm. ahead try it out and 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 see how you can grow and scale I love that and you know folks there were a whole host of topics by the way that we did not even get to today <laughs> around <laughs> right the path to profitability in business conversational copy um, optimizing funnels right um properly split testing things like these are all things that are in 
Paul's world that he has expertise around. And I highly recommend you go check out his website, go check out numerous resources that he provides there. Paul, are there any, um, any particular gift or resource that you would like to point people towards? Yeah, I, th I think a good place for you to start is if you if you go on that amplifycom.com uh, or lp.amplifycom.com slash mm -hmm. resources and then uh, on there, like the I think the Amplify Beyond Seven Figures audit is is a great place to start and it will it will ask you a bunch of yes, no questions and then you'll get a score and then it'll, it'll tell you what you need to go ahead and fix. Mm, perfect. We all love assessments. So if you did not catch that link, of course, hop over to the show notes. We are going to share all of Paul's links, including to his socials, his website, this particular resource uh, at the show notes page, which you can find at legalwebsitewarrior.com forward slash podcast. Go to Paul's episode and you can find everything that we've mentioned in this episode and more. Um, Paul, I so appreciate you. I look forward to being in touch and really learning, you know, over time more about how you support your clients. What final thought would you leave our listeners with today? And it can be a takeaway. It can just be something to mull over. It can be an action step. What would you like to leave people with? If you want, want to get the things that you want to get, take the actions that you need to take in order to go and get the thing and look systematically at what the biggest needle moving thing that you could do today to make that happen because otherwise you spend all your life being busy and not moving anywhere. You just go around in circles. Mm, I love that. Really staying focused on what's going to move the needle. And I think it's so easy for people to be overly busy in their business. Paul, I appreciate you. I look forward to sharing this episode. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks very much for having me, Heather.